just to start, this is the power of personal story. We're in room E, so if you meant to go somewhere else, you are welcome to get up and walk out at this point. Um, also, don't feel badly if at some point you do want to get up and check out another presentation. I promise I will not be offended. Um, these are all being recorded, so you can also check it out later if you miss something or if you do want to head out and go somewhere else and you can certainly catch up with what you missed. Um, my name is Emily Levinson. My Twitter handle is at Emily Levinson, which is really creative, I know. Um, for the whole creative inspiration today, I thought that was probably the most creative part of my talk. Um, and if you want to tweet about this session, I would love it. Just make sure you tag me in it so that I can follow along later when I check back in. That would be great. And the hashtag is PCPGH8 for anybody that wants to do that. Um, this presentation came about, honestly, because my whole, I want to say my whole business and online presence is really transitioning into this mode of storytelling. And so for me, this was a really apt topic. And it's interesting because I was looking at the schedule and I saw that there are quite a few presentations in the afternoon, also about storytelling, writing. Uh, there's, uh, I think, an entire session on telling stories. So that would probably be a really good follow-up to this because I'm really not going to talk about how to tell the story. I'm going to talk about why to tell the story uh, and why this is a really good way to infuse uh, creativity, to get inspiration, and to inspire other people who come to your site. So that's really where I'm coming from with all of this. Um, and just to let you know, I'm really informal when I do presentations, so if anybody has questions, you want to put something out there, you have something to share, please, you don't even need to raise your hand, just interrupt me, say what you want to say. Um, if there's something that you're like burning desire to say, though, if you really want to get through, raise your hand, that would be fine, too. Um, questions before we get started? Okay. All right, so just to give you a little bit about my personal story here, um, I am a holistic health coach and I'm transitioning into a more inspirational writer. Uh, I write a blog, I write a newsletter, um, I work with clients to do a lot of things, particularly in the area of holistic health, mindset, the stories that we tell ourselves and how that affects our health and our lives in general. Um, I also am one of the co-pilots of Propel, and if you looked at the schedule a few days ago, you might have noticed a different topic at this time in this room, um, and we were going to be talking about collaboration with Propel, Carrie was going to be here. She unfortunately could not. Uh, her market got rescheduled and she had zero control over it, but she was really sad not to be here. Um, but Propel also focuses on women entrepreneurs, the stories. We do a lot of interviews and spotlights on other inspiring women so that they can kind of inspire you if this is something that you want to do. So it really does come into play in what we're doing there. Um, my history as a blogger, it's funny to think about this because I started back with a craft business and Lindsay Petro of Survivor PGH was the person who just schooled me on blogging, told me that I had to do it, that this was like the way of the future, it was free marketing, and that everybody wants to know the story behind the business. And this is how you can start to get there. And when I started the blog, I was kind of skeptical of it. I had a free WordPress site for my craft business. And my sales doubled in the first like three months that I did it. And I was like, okay, I'm a believer. I get it. I get the importance of it. And for me, it was a way to go behind sort of the story, to go behind the craft and talk about where I got inspired from, what I was working on. I could show pictures of the books. I could get people invested in it. I had contests where people could put words on the different things. And it really built a more engaged audience for me. And that was really my entry into blogging. Over the course, I've probably had eight or nine different sites that I either started myself, that I contribute to, that I edit and run, um, and have just over the course really found the power of when you get personal, when you share stories, when you engage people, you, your stats change, that it's different. And I've had blogs where they don't work because it's more of the business focus and the business is doing this and the royal we and all that crap. And it never worked. It never took off. never got more than 20 hits a day, which slightly depressing when you're trying to do this for a business and reach the masses and you can't even begin right to reach anybody but your mother and her friends. Um, so it, and it was boring. I, mean, I bored myself writing it and I can only imagine how boring it was reading it. But, so there is background here. I do really believe in this. I've seen it stark contrast to when it wasn't working to when it was more personal to share more of myself. And I found that over time, the more that I share of my own personal story, the more engagement comes, the more I get emails back and comments and things like that. And for me, that's really the point of blogging and getting on social media is to have that interaction and that feedback. Maybe different for you, um, but I, I hope that we'll be able to kind of talk about 
just the point of all of this and, and encourage you to try something new, to put yourself out there, to maybe share a story once in a while and see how that works for you and see if it changes, even if you're a business, um, even if you're a corporation, that there's still a way to make things personal and human again. And we'll go through that. I have an exercise at the end, so you will get to actually try your hand at a story or come up with some ideas for yourself, too. Um, I'm also a social media fanatic. I think I've probably had 20 Twitter handles over the course of my Twitter career, which I don't even remember how long. I definitely was blogging before I was tweeting, so I think maybe it's been three or four years on Twitter. I'm not. I'm a new convert, a late convert to it. But I do love it, and I love Facebook. I love all forms of social media because it's a way to connect with people and engage. Uh, and I think they're fantastic business tools. As somebody who is a solo entrepreneur, for me, social media is like a necessary tool for my business. So I really do love this stuff. I believe in it a lot. And again, there's my Twitter handle. All right. So this is probably one of my most favorite quotes. And I've probably shared it on Twitter. I shared it on my blog a thousand times. And it's from Yana and Yana. Um, and it's about the power of sharing your story. So when you stand and share your story in an empowering, your, in an empowering way, your story will heal you and it will heal somebody else. And this is really, for me, the crux of it, that, that transformation happens when you share your story. Transformation for you, there's closure, there's coming to terms with it, it's really kind of identifying what you've learned out of an experience, and taking it from something that may have been a really crappy situation or something that wasn't the most positive thing, and really changing what you tell yourself about that. So it's shifting the story for you, but then also allowing somebody to make that transformation themselves so that they can learn vicariously through you and they can really find a way to um, apply those lessons to their own lives so they don't have to go through the misery in order to come out on the other end. Uh, not all stories are going to be that powerful or that transformative. Um, sometimes a story is just more about an engage, a way to engage a reader. Like, I had this really funny incident with a waiter at, you know, at lunch yesterday and this was the conversation and this is what it meant to me or this reminds me of something else that engages people, right? How many people in the room know about Haitian Families First? A few. How many people here know the story of two kids were girls who were caught in Haiti during the uh, earthquake who brought back a lot of Haitian children who got them adopted? How many people know that story? More people in this room. They're the same organization. But what you remember is the story about the two girls from Pittsburgh who had all these things happen. They got caught in the earthquake. It's a powerful memory, and it's an association for that. They got an Ellen. They got on the. They got interviewed by Katie Couric. Their story went viral, right? But that has helped their organization. You will remember them, and then therefore remember the organization. And that's something that sets them apart from any other organization that supports Haiti, that does something, or any other nonprofit in Pittsburgh. You know their story. And the more that you can make those connections, it's memorable for people. So that's the other reason here that the personal story is so important. All right. Kind of hinted at this a little bit. Oh, am I not the right? Oh, you're good. You're good. I'm just. I'm not here. Okay. Uh, so, what's the big deal about personal stories anyway? And the, the key thing here is engagement. And I kind of like hinted at this a few times with what I'm talking about here, but engagement. And, you know, what, why are you on social media? Is there a reason that you're doing this? Is it just because you like writing? Or is there a reason? Do you want other people to respond to you, to engage in the conversation, to get involved in it? And if you're just there to write your story, that's great. People are probably engaging in it because you're passionate about it or you're having fun. But if you're doing this for any other reason, engagement, it makes you feel good. When people comment on your post, when people acknowledge your story or your transformation, or at least just acknowledge that you're there and doing what you're doing, right? It feels much better than writing to your mother, who maybe at some point gets bored of it or is not really your ideal person to be reading it, unless you have a family blog, and sometimes that's the case too. But, uh, it also adds a human element to your business, to your site, to your online presence. And, you know, the, the robot accounts, you know, I, sometimes they're funny, but at the end of the day, people want to connect to other human beings. And that's one of the beautiful things about the internet, is it allows us to have a human connection anywhere in the world. And, and when, you become, when you share personal stories, when you have people, human element to your site, it engages. If you look at celebrity magazines, those are the number one purchase magazines. Why? Because they share a personal story about a human being. Right? And maybe celebrities, but the stories that say what celebrities look like without makeup, right? I just found one, and it pissed me off equally as I was entranced by it, but like celebrities who packed on the pounds during pregnancy. 
They're human too. They do me just like everybody else, right? It's the human element in the story. Same way with the kind of celebrity gossip sites and things. They, they kill it because it's all a personal element and it's all about that story, right? They're sharing gossip. They're sharing tidbits, things that you may not know about those people. The other thing is it makes whatever you're doing more believable. And this is key, whether you're a business or a writer or whatever else it is, it makes what you're doing more believable because you're human, you're a person, your story is meaningful to other people. Um, and I can say this, that I do food sensitivity testing. A lot of people think it's a bunch of crap, and that's fine. When I share my personal story about how it has affected my life, transformed my life, and made it so that I don't have migraines anymore, that I don't have job pain anymore, that my health completely transformed within the span of six months. That engages people and they say, I don't care what you're doing, just do it. Right? That part, that makes it more believable, it makes it legitimate, people can understand the connection between what it is that they're going for and what they're trying to achieve as the outcome because another human being has experienced success or you know whatever it is through that course of action. Um, it could be that you're writing about coaching, it could be that you're writing about a product, and that when you share those testimonials, when you share about those experiences that your customers have had, that that makes it more believable that somebody else would have that experience too. It also makes what you're talking about easier to understand. Everybody can relate to a story, a true human experience, to a mistake, to an, a bad experience. Even if they've never experienced it themselves, it's something that they can totally understand it because they understand the human element, they understand suffering, they understand learning, they understand sort of those key themes that come about from a personal story. Um, and they're memorable. Just like I said with Haitian Families First Girls, you may not know what HFM does as an organization, but you surely know or have at least heard of, that story sounds familiar, the two girls from Pittsburgh who got caught in the earthquake who rescued these kids and brought them back to Pittsburgh. That was like viral on the news. Is this making sense? All right. So some examples of personal stories here, and I, I have a website, so I want to just show you and we'll go through what these are. Uh, all right. So this story, okay. so this story is actually my personal one. And this is the first time that I opened up about it, uh, a year later after the fact, a year and some change later about the fact that I had a miscarriage back in July of 2012, is that where we are now? This post of this experience of this story, I have never in my life had more comments, more emails, more whatever, engagement around any blog post, anything I've ever written in this post. And because it was so deeply personal that this was something that wasn't just about a crappy experience because it was crappy. Uh, one of the worst of my life to this point. However, it didn't just end there. It wasn't just about the negative story. It was also about what I learned from it and what I, what I kind of figured out based on this about my life and how I found acceptance based on that. So for me, it wasn't just the fact of telling the story because, yeah, it was important, but that wasn't the reason I was doing it. There was also that need to say, I've learned something from it, and this is how I'm better as a human being because of it, even though I will still always say it's a crappy situation, that I, I don't want to do it again. Never want to experience that again. But, but this story is something that, I, like I said, I probably had 50 comments, comments on Facebook from it, on just the business page, which I've never had before. It was like one of those where Facebook tells you, this post is doing better than 99% of anything you've ever done. Right? More comments, I had probably 10 emails a day from other women who I had no idea had gone through something like this a day sharing this conversation with me. I had people posting in the comments. I had hundreds of likes on something. And then I put it on my personal page. And again, the same response. This post probably got 1,500 hits in a matter of three days. Again, I have never had something like that go viral. For me, those are big numbers. For you, they may be small change. That's fine. Uh, it's all relative. But, but again, the personal story is a very powerful experience. And I've also had quite a few women tell me that this helped them look back on their own experiences differently, that that was very cathartic for them to read it and healing. I had men who I had no idea was like the target for this. I thought it was going to be women say that every husband should read this. This should be required reading when you're trying to get pregnant, that men should know this because this is a very raw experience. This is important for us to know too about how you deal with something and how you go through a situation because it's different for us. 
that's what we're talking about here with the personal story. And, and yes, it's a very powerful one. It's a, you know, it's a, a pretty big experience. But the point is that there is a lot to be said for the personal story. Uh, so that's one example. Um, Kate, with the inspiration. I would be remiss if I didn't feature her either. Um, so her human element, her personal story that she shares is in the form of interviews. And she interviews people, inspiring 20 and 30-somethings in the city of Pittsburgh. And this is amazing. These personal stories, interviews, and she interviews them face-to-face, -face, writes about that experience, and then posts an actual interview. So is everyone familiar with the inspiration? No, if you're not, you really need to go back and read because there are quite a, quite a few amazing people, men and women, in here um, sharing their stories. So this is a little bit different when we talk about sort of the personal story, the human element. It's human because there are pictures of real people in Pittsburgh, and she's interviewing them and sharing their story. So it doesn't always, when you're sharing a personal story, it doesn't always have to be yours. It can be somebody else's. And interviews are a really fantastic way to do that. Um, for anybody that's looking for content, interviews are a really easy, fantastic way, one, to build your network, two, to also put out content that doesn't require a ton of your time and energy, and it can be anything like that, but again, it's personal. You, you always get a very personal feel from everything on her site. She has pictures of herself, she has pictures of the people she interviews, and then she's able to tell their story and all of the things that she does. So again, it's just a different way to share the personal story, but it's a really fun Light-hearted, probably a good contrast to the post about miscarriage, but uh, a really good light-hearted example of what it's like to share a personal story, and that it doesn't have to always be your own. Uh, all right, so anybody here a fan of hyperbole and a half? Okay, this post went viral, and I mean viral in my newsfeed. I saw it probably posted 15 times a day by 30 different people, like everywhere, and people were commenting about it. For those that don't know, Hyperbole to have, she's really known for these like hideous um, paint drawings that are like stick figures, and you can kind of see here, um, you know, that she has all of these different, this is like what she's known for, they're all comics, usually they're fairly funny. Um, she is somebody who suffers from depression, very deep, dark depressions, and she, at some point last year, I think it was back in September, had a really bad episode of depression. and. This was her post writing about it. She shared her personal journey with depression, what it felt like, what it meant to her, how it started with self-pity, and then she got robbed. Her depression robbed her of the ability to feel sorry for herself. And then it went into this dark hole. And it, the, the visual story that she told with the images combined with her writing was an incredibly powerful piece around depression. She actually had two parts of it. This is part one. And it's long. I mean, like, this took me 45 minutes to read. Like, you can scroll down and see. It was 45 minutes of text, and I was, like, raptured, like, enraptured by it. Like, I couldn't stop reading it, and I felt like I was missing stuff because I was so focused on this, and I would bounce back, and then I would come back. It was so engaging because it was so raw and honest about what she had gone through, um, and really just, and the images, of course, it kind of made it funny, and then you were, like, feeling weird because you were laughing about a really dark depression and all of this kind of stuff. If you haven't read Hyperbole and a Half or this post, it's a really great example. And it was so long, in fact, that she had to go to part two, uh, which was another 45 minutes of reading. But I mean, everybody, I mean, you just wanted to read the story and find out how she resolved it and how she got better and what the outcome was of this for her. Um, and, and how she sort of went from this really <laughs> dark hole and not taking care of herself to kind of slowly calling out of this whole depression. And it's one of the most raw. Um, descriptions I've ever seen about depression, and I used to work in the mental health arena before I switched to health coaching, um, and, and this was like incredibly poignant. It really spoke to it as somebody who has sort of been a warrior and, and really worked through it on her own, that this was a really powerful personal story, but you can see that it's not always just about sort of that there's images that go with it. She infused her own personality into the story as well, and it's a really if you've never read the blog, it's a really fun one anyway, but this story was super powerful, more so than anything else, because this really was the story. Um, but she also had, I was reading yesterday as, as I was doing some research on this, um, there was a story about how she had this dinosaur costume, mm -hmm. and how the dinosaur costume made her feel invincible and powerful, and how any time she would get into trouble, she was always powerful in the dinosaur costume, and the story that went with it. So it doesn't always have to be dark, deep, Right, things. It can just be a funny memory from childhood, and she happened to just draw it. But it was a really 
great story to think about like, oh, this costume, when you step into, put something else on, how does that change who you are inherently? So it was a fun, made you think about things and memorable, because I probably haven't read too much on her site after this one, but I remember both of these, and I read this a year and a half ago. So uh, there are a lot of things that are very memorable about that. Anybody here know Alex Franzen? Yes, and you don't. <laughs> Um, Alice Franzen is a writer and um, oh, she used to be a cover. I don't even know how to describe her anymore. She's amazing. She's brilliant. She's a fantastic writer. And she infuses her personality in everything she does. And she coaches people on sharing their story and how to engage with others and share, share a story with them that makes them feel special and wonderful and using words to um, really get across who you are, what you're thinking, kind of in that sense. And she always infuses her own personality into this. If you look at everything she does, she's come out with um, a new book called 50 Ways to Say You're Awesome. Um, and this is kind of one of the pages that are all sort of tear out notes that then you can leave. They have fill in the blank Mad Lib style things in the back that you can leave little love notes for people. Um, it's a brilliant, brilliant book uh, because then you also have to buy more because once you tear them out, then you need more to replace them. Uh, but she always sort of puts in stories about herself. She puts in um, sort of, you know, little poems. She's very much into writing poetry. And every now and then she'll write poems and just put them out for the sake of it. She creates games. Everything that she does infuses her personality into it. And that makes this an incredibly personal reflection of who she is, even though it's a business and she's making money off of it. And I will tell you, she does a really good job making money because her personality is so integral in here that it really becomes, you, you become engaged with her. You want to meet her. You want to work with her. You want to do everything that she puts out because she's amazing in that sense. And it's, it's her that you just want to meet her and hug her and love her and like have her be your best friend because that's just how you feel after you connect with her words and what she's writing. Pittsburgh Pirates. Right? I, how could I not talk about them, considering they're doing amazing? Um, is this for Pirates? Why is this not right? Okay. This is... Alright. The Pittsburgh Pirates are 2013 baseball season's best story. Right? The story of the Pirates and what they've overcome, what they've accomplished this season that they haven't done in the last 20 is pretty incredible. And pretty much all of America is rooting for the Pirates to win or to do something because they haven't done it in 20 years. And it's so meaningful now that they're able to do it, that these anniversaries or whatever it is that they've accomplished, their story of success or failure or whatever it's been that they've finally gotten it, right? And you think about sports, the Cinderella story. You, you want to root for the underdog. You want for them to win. You want for them to be well because of the story behind it. Um, ESPN 360. I don't love sports, but I like ESPN 360 because it's about the story behind the player. And it's talking about what they've overcome to get to where they are. Right? Those stories are impactful and meaningful, and that's really kind of where we're going here. Um, the story of Roberto Clemente. Even if you don't know how he played baseball, you know the kind of person he was, the kind of story and what he meant to Pittsburgh. Right? The duck. The story of the duck. People are like, like, who cares? It's a rubber duck floating down the river, but it's amazing. It's the story. It's the picture. It's the personal aspect that makes it fun, right? So thinking about those kind of things, I had to put this in here. It's just one of those. Um, all right. Anybody know the website, The Happy Herbivore? No? Any vegetarians in the room? No. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Happy Herbivore is a vegetarian, a plant-based food blog. And she's very um, specific in what she writes about, the kind of recipe she posts. She has a very specific philosophy around food and eating that doesn't involve oil, it doesn't involve meat, it doesn't involve dairy. Um, she really is big on that. But what she does really well is share testimonials and stories of the people that have used her recipes and made major life transformations. So this person lost 100 pounds by switching to a plant-based diet and using her recipes. 100 pounds, that's pretty damn significant if you're looking at all the weight loss. And what she does really well is she shows the pictures, she interviews them, and she puts that up there. So taking sort of the interview piece a little bit further than just posting up an interview because somebody's awesome or nice or whatever, and making it relate to exactly what your topic is. So there are ways to do that. Um, she features a herbie of the week. That's what she calls them. Uh, so they, they share their story. 
how they got inspired, how they made a change to a plant-based diet, what was impactful for them, how that trans transformation shaped their lives, how much weight they lost, how their health has changed because of it. And that is her sort of, I, I want to say, like, that's kind of her thing about a plant-based diet will make you healthier, it will make you a better person, it will make you feel better, it will cure disease, it will make you whatever. So she makes sure to highlight people who have had that experience based on making that change to a plant-based diet. Um, and she doesn't call it vegan, she doesn't call it anything else, she calls it a plant-based diet, so there's a reason I'm saying that. Uh, but that's, this is the way that she makes it personal because really she's posting recipes and she's talking about food. It's really not about her, it's not about anything personal, but that transformation and that um, that story of how others were impacted by it is really meaningful, and those are the ones that get the most comments, they're the ones that get the most likes. Um, she also does some Q&A kind of pieces, which is also adding a personal element in the human element, because your audience is asking questions, and you answer it for them, so it's bringing another side to the personal element. So I think she does these things really well, and maybe a way that isn't as obvious of sharing your personal story as it would be to like actually share your story. Um, so I wanted to make sure to put her in there. And then, of course, Miss Britt, who Britt's whole piece and whole kind of blog has been about sharing her story and using that story to help other people make transformations in their lives and to be happier. Um, and talks about how she did it for her. Britt wrote a book about this. It's really launched into other ways for it. Um, Britt even recently shared a story, and I think you share this quite a bit, about depression and how to prevent your own suicide, which I think uh, is it a really amazing way of sharing your story in a positive and transformative way, but pretty much everything on Britt's blog is the personal story. That's how she writes and what she writes about. And all of it is incredibly engaging uh, and has a huge following because of that personal element that people get really invested in that and care about what she's up to, what she's doing, uh, how she's doing it, and, and where she stands with things. So. Um, if you haven't checked out Brits Lab or you can talk, she's over here on the right. Um, I didn't know she was coming here. This is not a blog. <laughs> um, but follow the blog. It's really fascinating. It's really amazing in terms of what she's doing and how she's trying to be happier. And that journey really is endearing and it makes you want to follow along because she's doing it. I can do it. Right? And another good thing about that. I will say actually that this is something that I've learned from this blog. Um, it's a you know, personal development blog, and so it is supposed to be sort of how-to and advicey. But anytime I write something that doesn't have enough of me in it, it never does as well. Um, anytime I try to do like list-focused, or you know, it, it never ever does as well. But if I write it, if I write a story, those posts always always do better. So I know that's something for me that I always have to come back to. Okay, how can where did I learn this? Why am I telling this? Why is this important? And if I tell it from that as a story, it, it always, always, always resonates. Yeah. I'm sure everybody has stories that are going to be um, fairly universally interesting. What are your thoughts about figuring out what those stories are? Because you know, I think about my life, and I'm like, oh, I get up in the morning, I can grab coffee, I can do work. <laughs> like, it's very difficult for me to identify anything that I would think would be um, interesting or meaningful to share. I'm sure there's something in there somewhere, but how do you go about Figuring with that. It was just so interesting because your whole blog is personal. Yeah. Right? They're personal <laughs> stories. That's what you share on this one. Food pictures. <laughs> right, but, but sharing <coughs> pictures, sharing photos, I mean, that is personal. It's what you eat. People love, like, some of my favorite posts are looking and getting sneak peeks into people's homes or their craft rooms or their art rooms or, you know, their creative process. I love watching those things because it's the personal. It's so personal and it feels sort of voyeuristic, but I love those because I love that inspiration of where do other people find that? Um, I think for you, and we'll, we'll get to it, because there is a part of like, you know, how do you infuse more personal into your stuff? Uh, so we'll get there, I promise. Um, does anybody have, we'll come back, does anybody have any other kind of blogs or sites or stories that have been meaningful to them that they have really kind of hung on to or remembered recently, not so recently? What stories are the most meaningful? Yeah, there's an article that I actually ended up sending this around a lot. Um, a woman posted this article about her decision that she was only going to have one child and the, the thoughts that went, I think it was Rebecca Black, or, uh, not the one who seems the most. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, it was so personal in the thought process and the pros and cons, but that's something that sticks out to me. I, I mean, I think I read that like three years ago, and I still send that around. Yeah. Come on, you guys have even a few 
had a coworker who used to work at a newspaper, and um, you know, he was diagnosed with cancer. It was really late. There was very little they were going to be able to do, and so he was a writer for the newspaper. So he was right, he's going to write a blog about it. That's called Life or something like it, and uh, it just kind of went through the last four months of his life, even to the point where, like, the last week, the only thing he took was just like the characters didn't even make sense. And so, it's the only blog I've ever saved. And like, whenever I'm feeling down by myself, they already go back three times. Like, yeah, just always go back. That's a great one. I wish I could remember his name. I think it's Scott something. Um, and he's a writer for like the New York Times or something like that. Uh, and his mom died recently, and he was like live tweeting it basically. And like all of a sudden, tons of people. That sounds really morbid, but she was. I did the same thing when my dad died, you know. So um, it was like an ongoing process, you know. I'm just talking about what it was like to see her going through this, you know, the goodbyes, and the people coming, and like it just went completely viral. Everyone was like, "You need to start following this guy." It wasn't about anything we'd ever talked about normally, but you know, that was something that everybody. Could relate to, and, and the way he shared it was so. Um, he just did a really beautiful job, and it was really um, as honorable and graceful and stuff the way he did it. Um, but that was, I had no idea. I still follow him, and like, I had no clue what he wrote about before that or not. But um, yeah, yeah, just made me really look at him. Yeah. Anything else? I don't know if there are any nature lovers in the room, but. Uh, there's a wonderful nature writer named Julie Zickerfus who uh, has a blog. She's from, from Ohio and she's an artist. And so she does her blog, covers everything from art pieces that she's working on, which she'll show you in the stages, which is all and explain um, often what she's thinking and how, how she's technically doing it. Um, and then she has a wonderful family and they're, they're, in, a, they're in a wonderful you know, band called the Rain Crows. She and her husband and his mothers. And she has some terrific kids, and she features them. But the real focus of her blog is her Boston Terrier named Chet Baker, which mm -hmm. has this humongous fan club. And um, basically, her blog is her day. She leaves her house and walks down a country road, and everything she sees on that walk with her dog and back again. And uh, but through the eye of a, 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 an artist and a writer and a mother and a dog lover, and that. It's, it's, it's a really very pleasant. Um, it's the one that I. Keep, keep tabs on most of all. Okay. Um, one of my comics friends, uh, more specifically, I'm going to go with Matt Diggs. He lives out in LA. He uh, used to do a um, pretty much a weekly strip about his actual life. There was a there's a point there. He doesn't really update it that much because well, like kind of went through on stories. But there was a point where he had to. Rescue had he had to adopt uh, his bro I think it's like his his wife's brother's daughter or whatever, and now they're raising her. So there's a little bit of that in there. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, whenever somebody does that, so whenever somebody touches on the human aspect of it, it just it becomes that much more powerful. Absolutely. And even food bloggers, oh, you have. Uh, Kevin Bolfio's um, My Own Mascot. It's a three, three panel comic that he sometimes does. And it's just like little bits of his adventures and like, being a cartoonist. And, yeah. Those are great. These are all such, I'm like excited to go back and check out all these sites that you guys are talking about. They yeah. sound great. Um, food bloggers, even, right? Like, how boring is it to just look at a recipe? Like, unless you're searching for a recipe, but my favorite food blogs had nothing to do with the recipes. It had everything to do with the story of how the food got created, what the blogger did that day, why this, you know, why they kind of got onto that journey. But it was all about the story that happened with the meal or who they had over when they were having dinner and what the people thought of it. For me, it was always more about that than the recipe. I can find recipes in cookbooks. I can go to the library. There are, you know, 10 shelves of cookbooks that I can find. So for me, that wasn't the meaningful part. It was the story. Um, and, and that's what endeared me, like how sweet it is, like the How Sweet blog, when she uh, does that. I, her recipes, I, they're all bacon and butter and things that I don't eat or can't eat. But man, do I follow her blog obsessively. Like, I love her images, but I love her stories even more. And she's found a way to engage people by how she talks about the food. And then she'll tell a story about 90210, and then she'll tell a story about nail polish and the 80s and, like, all this kind of stuff. 
And it just bounces around, but I love it because it's not just here's a food. Here I use bacon yet again, and yes, it has 10 sticks of butter in it, and yes, it's delicious, right? <laughs> not that exciting. Like built whole business doing that. Her cooking show, like she shows the show, and she shows you know life a day in the life on the ranch or things and everything. Yeah, do you guys know about Penny Allen? Yeah. Um, Alright, so those are, all right, do you guys get, I mean, like, do you see the kind of variances of the personal story in here too? I was trying to pick some, not just the same kind of blogs over and over to show you guys. Um, Alright, so how do you do this? Elizabeth, she'll get to your <laughs> question. Uh, so tell us a story. And I want you to all write this down because I love PodCamp and I love how all these ideas come through and then you go home and it's like you forget 90% of them or it's like you implement one thing. But I want you to have something to take home with you. So what's something that's happened to you recently? Write it down. Type it up, use your pen, tweet it, I don't care. Put a video at breakfast, you got here late, you got stuck in great traffic or closures, whatever you want it to be about. Kind of have the gist of the story. Uh, everybody has something in mind, at least. Yeah, kind of. All right. If you can't think of what happened to you recently, then maybe what's something that was interesting that happened to somebody else? It could have been the story about your reporter friend who was blogging about cancer, that story not impacted you. It could be about how you had this conversation at PodCamp and met somebody brand new for the first time, and that you learned something fun, cool, interesting, that you're really excited to get to know them. Whatever you want it to be, but it could be something cool that happened to somebody else. Does everybody have at least one thing in mind? All right. How can you relate that to your audience? How does this story connect for your readers or for the focus of your blog or for your kind of the people who follow you on Twitter, wherever you want to post this on Facebook? How does this story relate to them? It could be that your topic is happiness and you have this really happy, wonderful day going to see the doc down at the point. <laughs> And that made you smile and laugh, and you saw people playing and having fun, and that was inspiring to you. It could be that your story about this waiter and how they were really rude and what you learned about yourself and how you handle that kind of criticism or that kind of flex. It could be that you took a walk in a park, and what did you find along the way? What were the hidden treasures? Maybe there was a story about something that you created based on what you found or what you experienced. But how does that relate to your audience and who you're writing? And then a really great way to end these, particularly if they're a more dark story or something that could be framed in a more difficult, in quotes, kind of way, miscarriage, cancer, um, a loss of some sort, uh, a really difficult kind of situation, or your struggles as a new parent. Maybe that there are things in there that you've learned along the way. What lessons did you learn? Because this piece makes a difference between just telling a story to tell a story versus engagement. And if you can share what you learned about it or what somebody else learned about it, what was meaningful about that experience, that this here is sort of the crux that pulls it together and builds that engagement. So, um, you know, make sure that there's something, that some outcome, some way that it connects for people and something that they can either take from it or that you took from it, that there was some form of transformation that happened and maybe you can explain that or talk about it. Feel like you have something that you could share in this realm here? Yeah. All right. Interview another human being because humans are people. It's personal when you talk about people, right? So it could be around anything you want it to be. Is there somebody that you've been dying to talk to or would love to be able to feature? Anybody? Could be somebody you made a podcast. Right? It could be something, actually Alex does something really cool on his site about sort of mixtapes or has people pick songs. Um, he has a personal element by asking people for specific things. So whatever your topic is, it could be sports, it could be books, it could be happiness, it could be business. For Propel, we do spotlights on women entrepreneurs, it's very honed in. Um, I do a post once a week called Everyday Heroes where I interview inspiring women or women who have inspired me in my life to show that all women are inspiring. 
about all people, pretty much, but I really cater to women in what I do. Um, so for me, it's about inspiring women. Um, again, it could be a specific population. So it could be women, it could be men, it could be bloggers, it could be tech geeks, it could be business owners, it could be people from Pittsburgh, uh, it could be GLBTQ community, it could be anything. Right? So there doesn't necessarily have to be a theme around it, but if you Going to do it regularly, it helps. It's a review of the week. So, anybody that's ever used your product before, if you have a business, anybody that has had experience with your writing and had a really cool experience from it, if you have a book out, if people have read your book and made transformation, it could be a really cool feature or interview around that. Um, it could also be in different formats. So, when we're talking about adding a human element, this doesn't all have to be written word. Um, and one thing that I stumbled across, and I totally forget where I found it. But instead of it being an actual written interview, it was a photographic interview. So that there were prompts for it, and the whole interview was just pictures. Not a single written word about it. And it was to show us the day in your life, what did you get up to today, what projects are you working on, what does your craft room look like, and the whole photo, it was just sort of this book around it. It was incredible. Mary Stewart just started a podcast, uh, Brunch Bird, where yeah. is she, I got to be interviewed for it. Go to brunch, and she interviews you about whatever you talk about brunch. It's all around Pittsburgh. Yeah. So. Personal element. So podcast would be great. Video, right? Um, you know, Kate does a face-to-face -face meeting with people for inspiration, and then she writes about it. So there are a lot of different ways that you could do that. But you could do a Skype interview and just post the video from Skype. Like, it doesn't have to be this big, fancy, long-winded anything. It can be one image, it could be 20 images, it could be a written word, it could be an interview that you send to somebody and they send back to you and put it up on your site. It could be asking for mixtapes or you know songs, favorite songs, and putting that together. Um, another thing Alex does that I think is really fun is to do tweets of the week. And he'll feature fun tweets of the week. And that's you know partly interviewing, but it's having fun, it's adding a personal element, it's connecting it to people and experience online that makes it more real, more personal. So those are other ways to do it. Ideas here, do people kind of, does this spark something for you? Does anybody have an interview in mind or something that they would love to do that would just talk to another human or get that up there? Yeah. All right, making it visual. So even if you don't, if you have a business and it's not appropriate to do something, if you have a blog where it doesn't make sense, but it's really more about you and it has nothing to do with other people, just adding visual interest to your site that is personal can also be a way to share your story in a different way. So having images, it could be what you find on your walk through nature. It could be that you went down to see the duck, and there's a picture of the duck and people around it and your experience. Uh, it could be uh, sharing images of your home space. It could be sharing it around your workspace. Whatever it is that is meaningful to you. Um, I see people do sort of like their animals or, you know, where the whole blog is dedicated to that. I see it where... I've already done Flat Stanley, like a, I think it's like a sixth grade project or something like that, where Flat Stanley goes around the world or wherever, and you take pictures of this like laminated image of Flat Stanley in different places. We had so much fun doing that. I, I happened to live in London when kids that I were, was a nanny for sent me this. It was their class project, and we went around and took pictures of Flat Stanley everywhere in London, and it was incredible. I could do a whole blog on Flat Stanley or like a little you know toy or whatever. There are people who do those things. It's personal. It's interesting. It's quirky. It's fun. You you don't even have to do this on a blog. It could be on Flickr account. It could be on your Instagram account. Right? There are ways to make things personal and share your personal story without it necessarily having to be blog focused either. Um, you kind of share about your life. Elizabeth, you were talking about food. Like that's kind of sometimes the only interesting thing. That's fine. There is a whole segment of the population that loves looking at food pictures. Right? I get more comments and hits on food than I do anything else. Like, I'll try to share more of my life, and people only want to know what I eat. Right? It's really weird. Maybe it's because I was a food blogger for so long that people really do care about those things, but um, it's, it really is the most common thing that I get carded or thumbed up or whatever, that that tends to go more viral and get more comments. Sorry, I can't. Okay. I've noticed, too, I think it's really cool. Sometimes it might not fit on your blog or your business website, but... Um, it's cool when you have those other platforms that you can show maybe personal stuff there. Um, one person that, I'm sorry in the lobby about that, but one person that does that is the weather guy, right? What's his name? WPS, whatever. Oh, so so yeah. Um, I don't know when he lives here yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> I do, like, like, I'm pretty sure he's not technically the only weather guy. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows that, and now he's not putting up his personal stuff on the news' his website. But on Twitter and Instagram, he's like, go Bucks, and, you know, I'm on vacation, and 
you know, I think that's really cool. And like I said, it's not going to put it on the news website, but you get to see enough of this personal stuff there. Jim, love you all of that. Print locate, Jim. He, he also does that. He does that really well. He's in Boston now, and I still care about what he does, which is really, I don't watch, you know, I don't watch him on TV, but I care about what he's up to because there's enough of his personality in through there. And I think Mikey and Big Bob do that really well too, that on Instagram and on Twitter, they really do share more about themselves and what they're doing and what they're up to, and that is even more endearing and builds more connections to what they're up to. So you're right, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be on your blog, and I, I know that I've been focusing more on that because that's where I focus a lot of my time and energy, but if you're not bloggers necessarily, you can use any form of social media to do this, all the same principles involved or kind of relate. The other thing is if you're an artist, sharing your work is intensely personal, right? To, to have more of yourself in these different things, and this is something that I've been trying to work in more, is to have more of my own creative expression. It's something that I've missed. And there was an August break 2013 challenge about posting that Sam introduced me to actually that had themes and prompts for the day and the outcome for me was that creative expression was incredibly important to me and somehow it got missed. And even though I'm creative in what I do and I feel like there's a lot of creativity infused in things, my actual <coughs> artwork or doodles or drawings or things that I used to love or even just photographs that I liked that had nothing to do with food that that was missing. And when I started to post those things, I started to actually get a different kind of engagement from people. And people got to see a different window into me versus just the food that we were eating, which, yeah, that's great, but I'm kind of bored with it. And right, I want something else. I want there to be more kind of to me than just food. Um, so being able to share that, I found that that was a fun way of sharing quotes that were inspiring to me. And every Monday I share motivational, inspirational quotes. It engages my audience. It targets exactly who I want target, but it gives me an outlet to be creative, to share something that is a piece of me, even if I wasn't the one to say it, but words, important words or powerful words from other human beings is something that really resonates for me, and I find that that can add a personal touch to it as well. Um, any other kind of ideas around making things more personal or adding a personal story to what you're doing? Yeah. How do you navigate or negotiate with your partner? Sharing something that yeah. they probably might not love that. Um, one way to do it is to make them slightly anonymous, although I think it's a little hard for me because I use my last name, so you should probably find out who my husband is if you really wanted to. Um, for a long time, he didn't want that to be known, so he was lovingly called the hubster. I never made mention to him. His name was not anywhere on my site. Um, for a while, it wasn't my full name on the site, but once whatever, it happened. Um, but I kind of used the rule of thumb for me that if they – if they wouldn't tell the story themselves, then I won't tell the story, right? Or I'll find ways to shift it because his mother used to read it and like call on me like, hey, I heard you did this. And he'd be like, what? How did you find out? Oh, <laughs> she told him, oh, did you share that story? Like it was one of those kind of things. Um, other rules on my mom reads my site, and if I wouldn't tell her something, I am not telling the world that same thing, right? So there's sort of that, and there's a difference in being personal and sharing private information. And I think... I kind of talked about it in the description, and it didn't come in here as much, but the personal versus private, I think, is also very important because you don't have to share every single detail of your life and experience in order for it to still be personal. So really using kind of that sensor, the mom gauge, or whomever, if your partner would read it and she would be pissed. You know, it was one of those things that if she doesn't want that information out there, to really, truly respect that, to change the details, to change it, if you can still get your point across in a way that is. Um, I find that sharing your own experience People really can't give you crap for that because it's what you experienced um, in there and you're sharing your truth. Although, depending on, I mean, obviously it depends on how you write it and the kind of things that you're sharing about that experience. But, uh, you're, you know, you share your experience as a new father, as somebody who's going through that. It has nothing to do necessarily with her. It's about your life, your lesson that, that your experience has been there. And I generally find that that kind of role, and then also the mom role, like if, if she would be unhappy reading something or if the other person would not, and you are not willing to have that face-to-face -face discussion with them, probably not a good idea to write about it until there's at least more space around it. Does that answer? Yeah, I'd say it probably is easier for a woman husband to be accepting than it is for a man's wife. It's not that there's that many men bloggers, but it is, I'd say my bar is a little lower. My, my husband what, is what like I come obsessively private. But he, I mean, he does IT for a bank. He does not want that information online at all. Yeah. And like, if you read my blog, you almost don't really know that he's he's actually going to things with me because he's really rarely on there. Yeah. So anything that I write about that is like 
about him other than like a passing mention that he exists. Um, I let him read first before I post it because otherwise he'll be angry if I'm talking about things that happen to him. But he like, I mean, my blog, it, it, you really don't see much of him on there at all because he. He's not even on Facebook. <laughs> he really does not. I know. I always think people probably don't even think I'm married. Yeah. Because <laughs> my husband wants to be completely off the grid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you and talking about too, like things that might make them uncomfortable, or things that they definitely like the wife definitely don't want to? Because I think this might make me kind of an asshole, but there are some things that I will write about my husband and I'll show it to him. And he's like, he would never write it, but sometimes the story is important enough that. I'm going to share it anyway. Like, and I might respect his privacy, but it might make him uncomfortable, you know? And sometimes people are uncomfortable. Like, I'm okay with that. Um, I think that, that that's okay, too. If you're okay with making somebody uncomfortable, that's... I, I certainly am, but uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. my wife isn't always, so it's... Uh, and she, again, she's not on anything, so it's just, like, a different level of... Yeah. I mean, does she, does be she with read some, it? Yeah, but yeah. just like that, be with somebody that is your partner throughout this that isn't a share. Right. So it's yeah. weird to try to communicate to them how you're, it's, uh, you know, the whole, you know, what goes along with yeah. that. It's, it's a weird. And, and I will say, because when I shared the story about my miscarriage, there were things that my husband did or didn't do that were integral to that part of the story. And he read it. I was a little nervous for him to read it because there were points where I talked about him just, like, getting on with his life. And I was, like, broken and crumbled and, like, in a puddle over here. While he was like laughing and happy and having fun with life again, um, and and that he didn't really have the same reaction to it, and and that was meaningful because of what was happening, and he was really proud of me for putting that out there. So I think some of it is the importance of what you're saying, like Brett's talking about, and some of it's also like you're sharing a meaningful experience to help other people get through the same experience. And so if you add in about what you're learning from those things, that it's not just you're sharing it to just share it to. Be shocking or to get you know put that out there that if there's a reason behind it and that sort of lesson learned piece that I think that that oftentimes can um, change the the story or the vibe of it enough that that becomes okay because you're sharing it for a reason it's not just to share it to share it does that make sense okay. I think it's just also a personal comfort level with what you're okay with I mean I'm completely satisfied with having my blog content focused on my stories I mean I can't, I mean, I, when you're saying like there might be a story that would be uncomfortable to your spouse but still posting it for the reason of the story, like my priorities are different, so like I would never even get to the point of thinking that there was a value in a story that was higher than his um, uh, being uncomfortable just because my priorities are in a yeah, different Yeah, that is, it is so. totally personal and there's yeah. some, like some stories like I'm not going to make there was a point where I would totally be okay with making my husband uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not proud of that. That was absolutely was, that's where I was. Yeah. Um, now I'm not going to make my husband uncomfortable to be funny. I might make my husband uncomfortable if it's a story that I really wholeheartedly believe for six months life. Yeah. You know, like I don't think he's comfortable with me talking about the fact that sometimes I think about suicide. Yeah. But that's more important to me. You know. But it's absolutely a personal. Case by case, and that's always evolving. You know, I just think it's okay. It's it's important to let people know that sometimes it's okay to make somebody else uncomfortable. It doesn't necessarily make the bad person. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. I see that. Are we close to time? Are we at that morning? Okay. But I like for what whatever you guys wrote down, whatever was inspiring you about sharing the personal story. I want you to decide how you're going to share that right now because I want you to commit to doing it, and then either today, this weekend, Monday morning, I want you to share a personal story and see how that feels for you and what what that experience is like, put that out there if you're not used to doing it. So um, how would you do it? It could be a blog post about a story, it could be an interview, it could be an image, whatever you feel is the most appropriate for you, but I want you to pick one thing, be big or small, I don't care what you do. Um, and then I would love for you to tag me or tweet me or share it with me so that I can also share that for you and put that out there and, and comment and engage and really kind of be a part of that because I'd love to see what you come up with based on kind of your experiences, and I just like that stuff, so. Any other questions? I want to be respectful that everybody can get to the next session. Um, I just want to make up in the web addresses that you had up there. Sure. Um, I can actually give you, if you want to see them on here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
their two agents. Does anybody else want those websites? I can also tweet them if you want me to, but did everybody kind of get them? Yeah? That's the first, first slide. And the thing that's interesting about the hyperbolean hash is that you notice in the dates, and I remember this as I follow her, the first part of the depression blog was in 2011, and she didn't write anything until the second part came out in 2013. Yeah. And the second part went just as viral as the first part because everybody who loved reading her was waiting for her to come back. Yeah. I, you know, it didn't even occur to me, and I see that there was the whole year part. All right, well, thank you guys. You are fantastic, and I look forward to seeing my stories. Thank you. Thank you.